We turn today to a close-up of the personality and character of the prophet Joseph Smith. May I begin with a comment of the late Sidney B. Sperry, perhaps our most knowledgeable Hebraist, that is, expert in Hebrew, who studied years ago with some of the world's renowned scholars at the University of Chicago, and then came to Brigham Young University and remained here for his entire career. He told me that early in his life he had aspired to know more about the scriptures than any man living. One reason he studied ancient languages was to gain the advantage of reading in the earlier source materials. Some of his colleagues spoke of him as the accomplished SBS, his initials, because of his scholarly achievement. But he also told me, and this is the point, that he became thoroughly discouraged in his ideal, primarily because he became aware that no man in this generation could possibly know as much about the scriptures as did the prophet Joseph Smith. He said to me once, I believe I will not be accounted worthy to black his boots in the life to come. And he was a very worthy man. I begin with that because there is a feeling that constantly recurs in the study of the life of Joseph Smith. It is that you never quite get to the bottom. There is always more. You can be so impressed and overcome with glimpses that you say, nothing I could learn of him would be surprising, and then you become surprised. There is always more. It takes deep to comprehend deep, and I often wonder if any of us have the depth to fully comprehend this man. But I want to focus today not so much on his prophetic character and gifts as simply on the observed characteristics of those who surrounded him. Joseph Smith, the man. Look for a moment at his appearance. We know from the record that he was in his prime a little over six feet two in height. We know that he weighed over 200 pounds and that one of his advantages all through life was an extremely vigorous, dynamic, physical constitution. Had he not had that, he might not have survived the first major crisis of his life, which was, you recall, when he had a bone infection, a requirement in most instances of amputation. The doctor, under the pleading of Mother Smith, finally consented to perform surgery, but without anesthetic. If you can imagine having a section of your bone cut out and removed while you are fully conscious, you will understand what he bore. Dr. Worthlin in our generation has shown that this one physician who was from the Dartmouth Medical College in New Hampshire was the only man in the United States who understood how to perform that operation and who had the compassion and the skill to do so. Now that's only one glimpse of a hardy, enduring physical constitution. Now even at that, he bore all he could bear and was prematurely old at age 38. We know further that the death mask applied by George Cannon, a convert from England, to the faces both of Joseph and Hiram after the Carthage assassination gives us exact lineaments of his forehead, his hairline, which was in 1844 receding some, partly as a result of poisoning. And we know that his nose was, as the statues on Temple Square depict, unusually large. 
And yet, it is the comment of those both visiting from the East and of his own convert friends that he was a magnificent man. The word handsome recurs, and there is some reference to the color and abundance, at least in the earlier years, of his hair. It was an auburn cast. Something about the transparency of his countenance, for he was beardless. He did shave, but he did not have a heavy or thick beard. And a good deal about the shape of his body, that, as one writer puts it, there was no breakage about it, meaning that he had a strong and robust pair of shoulders and then tapered down, and there weren't uh, ins and outs at any point. He had become a little portly in the late years in Nauvoo. If you read all of the witnesses, there are a few manly sports that he didn't have a try at, and there were many in which he excelled. For example, he wrestled and wrestled effectively. He jumped at the mark, which is a situation where you simply drew on the ground a mark, then jumped and marked where you landed, and then challenged someone else to match or exceed. He pulled up stakes, two men facing each other, placing feet against feet, and then pulling. The stronger is the one who remains on the ground. The other comes up. There's a, another version of that where you hold face to face a pole, something like a broomstick, and then pull down. The stronger of the two holds and his hands don't slip. The weaker's hands slip. He also, with the boys, played baseball and variations on quoits. He was known to create games with prizes, including booby prizes. On other occasions when he did that, he would say, you must excuse me, but when I'm with the boys, I make all the fun I can. So much for the athletic side. Now we turn for a moment to his mind. It was a remarkable mind. Mother Smith records that he was the least inclined of all her family to books in his early years. And yet, as he matured and as the weight of his calling came upon him, he became an assiduous, hard reading student, poring over and over the scriptures, and as you well know, being appointed to go over them line by line and make inspired changes. But in addition to that, he came to aspire to the ancient languages. He set up a school in Hebrew, as you know, with Joshua Sitches in Kirtland, and aspired to teach these gentlemen as well as to learn himself, when few of them had even mastered English in its rudiments. It is the verdict of the minutes that the two outstanding students in that school were Joseph Smith and Orson Pratt in that order. The worst, as you might have guessed, was Heber C. Kimball. The prophet became so impatient one day with Heber. He said, Heber, you learn that Hebrew vowel or I'll whip you. And Heber said, go ahead and whip. <laughs> <laughs>